Do you think you've mastered pediatrics? Let's put your knowledge to the test. In this trivia challenge, we'll cover four core topics. Pediatric pulmonology, pediatric gastroenterology, pediatric cardiology, and acute pediatric emergencies. Each topic includes three questions. One easy, one medium, and one hard, worth one, two, or three stars. You'll have a moment to think before we reveal the correct answer, along with a brief explanation from Lecturio's expert medical content. Keep, score as you go, and find out how strong your pediatric knowledge really is. Let's get started. Let's kick things off with an easy one. Which of the following best explains why albuterol is not recommended in the routine management of bronchiolitis in infants? Well, first, as you can see on this slide, you are not going to give this child albuterol. As tempting as it may be, if this is bronchiolitis, albuterol does not shorten hospitalization, does not increase the, or decrease the likelihood of being hospitalized in the first place, and it does make children jittery. Time to dial it up. Let's try a medium one. What is the primary reason magnesium sulfate may be used in severe pediatric asthma exacerbations? But there are other medications that can help as well. An example would be magnesium. Magnesium has, is a two plus ion, just like calcium, and thus is a competitive inhibitor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the smooth muscle cell inside the airway. So the magnesium is gonna allow that airway to relax. Side effect though, is that it really relaxes all your smooth muscle and so you may develop hypotension. Now for the tough stuff, see if you can crack this. A nine-year-old boy is brought to your clinic for evaluation of a chronic productive cough. His mother reports that he has had constant colds since infancy, including multiple episodes of otitis media and several sinus infections per year. She also mentions he had pneumonia twice in the last 18 months. On physical exam, you note digital clubbing and nasal congestion with visible polyps. Auscultation reveals decreased breath, sounds bilaterally, and heart sounds are best heard on the right side of the chest. So in ciliary dyskinesia, there are several tests that you should expect to be abnormal. A chest x-ray should show recurrent pneumonia, or in some cases, situs inversus. Pulmonary function tests should be abnormal. These patients should have difficulty with clearing of mucus and residual lung dysfunction. And frequently for the diagnosis, we actually have to go in and get a biopsy of the lungs and do an electron microscopy where you can actually see the cilia and the defect. And that's really the way we have to make this diagnosis definitively. We'll start pediatric cardiology simple. See if you know this one. Which of the following is not typically classified as a cyanotic congenital heart disease? I'm gonna close now with a trick which will help you try to remember the types of cyanotic heart disease, and it's easy if you just use your hand. So remember, there are five types, and I remember them like this. One, two, three, four, five. I'll go through them one at a time. One is truncus, and you can see my thumb is a trunk coming off the main mixing of the right and left ventricle. Next is transposition, and you can see I've taken my two great vessels and I've mixed them together. Next is tricuspid atresia. Next is tetralogy of Fallot. And the last one is totally anomalous pulmonary venous return. So that's a good trick to try and remember the five types of cyanotic heart disease. That's very likely to show up on your test. Also, remember those four findings in the tetralogy of Fallot. You're doing great. Now, let's take it to the next level. A seven-year-old boy is brought to the clinic due to fatigue during physical activity and persistent leg discomfort after running. 
his growth has been within normal range, but blood pressure measurements in school health checkups have been abnormally high. An MRI angiogram is performed. Which of the following additional findings is most likely in this patient? As you can see on the slide here, this patient has a normal aortic arch that's coming along and then there's a pinched area right where the green highlight is. This is a narrowing of the aorta or a coarctation of the aorta after it leaves the ventricle. One common finding in patients with coarctation of the aorta is rib notching. What basically happens is that because of the low pressure of the descending aorta, a pressure gradient is created between the internal thoracic artery and the descending aorta. Because the blood pressure in the internal thoracic artery is higher than the descending aorta, an increased collateral circulation takes place through the intercostal arteries. This can lead to the appearance of rib notching on the chest x-ray, where the lower surface of the rib appears eroded. Ready for a challenge? This one's on the harder side. What is the most appropriate initial pharmacologic treatment for a neonate with suspected hypoplastic left heart syndrome prior to echocardiographic confirmation? So if you suspect hypoplastic left heart syndrome and there's going to be a delay in the diagnosis, you may need to intervene before you actually make that diagnosis. And the first thing we're going to do is start prostaglandins. Remember, prostaglandins prevent the closure of a patent ductus arteriosus. So if that ductus arteriosus closes, that baby is going to become hypotensive and you're gonna have end artery perfusion problems, tissue damage, brain damage, renal damage, liver damage. So keeping that patent ductus arteri arteriosus is open is critical. Let's kick off the pediatric gastroenterology section with an easy one to get us started. Which of the following triads is considered classic for intussusception? Patients who have intussusception will have a classic triad of symptoms. So the classic triad is intermittent colicky abdominal pain, vomiting, and bloody stools. Now, this is what you'll see written on your test, and you should definitely remember this. The reality is, though, is that most intussusception, we do not actually find bloody stools. It's a rare finding when the diagnosis has been missed for a long period of time. Here comes a medium difficulty question. A five-year-old male is brought to the ED due to several episodes of dark terry stools mixed with occasional bright red blood over the past week. He has no abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, or recent dietary changes. His past medical history is unremarkable. Lab work reveals a hemoglobin of 9.8 grams per deciliter and microcytic hypochromic indices. An abdominal exam is benign, with no tenderness or palpable masses. A technetium 989M per technetate scan is performed. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? The way we test for a Meckel's diverticulum is by using a radionucleotide scan, a technetium 99M per technetate scan, and we're gonna look for gastric mucosa that is outside the stomach. So you can see here that mucus cells have taken up the per technetate, and they've done it as where the arrow shows on the slide at the level of a Meckel's, which is outside the stomach, which is the large dark blob that you can see at the top of the slide. Here comes a hard one. Dig deep, 
which of the following exposures is most strongly associated with increased risk of salmonella gastroenteritis in children? Ask about exposure to farm animals or reptiles. This is actually a really important question because a common cause of salmonella in children is reptile pets and a common cause of E. coli and especially the variety that causes hemolytic uremic syndrome is from farm animal exposure. Here's an easy one to warm up the pediatric emergency medicine section. Which of the following statements about antipyretics in febrile seizures is correct? What's key about febrile seizures is that antipyretics don't prevent them. In other words, telling families, use ibuprofen every time your child gets a fever, we want to prevent seizures, will not work. In fact, in children who've received that counseling, they have the same number of seizures as children who don't. Let's push it a little further with this one. At what dose is acetaminophen considered potentially toxic in children? Typically, a dose of Acetaminophen may be toxic if more than 150 milligrams per kilo has been given or in young children if they're getting repeated overdoses. This one's not easy. Let's see what you've got. A seven-year-old boy presents after falling on his hand. The following x-ray is obtained. Which of the following best describes and classifies this fracture? So the arrow points you to the fracture. You can tell that this is a skeletally immature patient because you can see the growth plate open in these bony structures. Here you can see the growth plate right here, and then this is the fracture right here. So this is a fracture of the growth plate that extends through the metaphysis. This is a Salter-Harris type 2 fracture, which tends to have a pretty good prognosis, and this is also the most common of the Salter-Harris fractures. And that's a wrap. How many stars did you earn? If you scored 3 to 12 stars, you're a pediatrics rookie, off to a great start on your learning journey. If you earned between 13 and 25 stars, you're a pediatrics pro, you've got a solid foundation. And if you scored 26 to 36 stars, congratulations, you're a pediatrics master. No matter your level, keep building your skills with Lecturio, your all-in-one study companion for success in pediatrics. Drop your score in the comments and tell us. Which topic you want to test next?